Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and with me tonight is newly re-elected city councilman John C. Liu from uh, the Flushing and Northeast Queens neighborhood known as District 20 to those of you who follow the process. Councillor Liu, good evening, and uh, tell me, the election has um, just ended in, oh, a disastrous defeat for us libertarians and a glorious victory for the Demoblicans and the Republicrats as usual. <laughs> and um, I'd like for you to start by telling us a little about what we can expect in the next uh, several years as um, Mayor Bloomberg begins his second term and as you begin the, um, I guess it would be the fifth year of your um, tenure in the city council. What's the the city government's agenda and what's your specific agenda? Well, first let me say that I, I certainly wouldn't characterize the election as a resounding defeat of any kind for the Libertarian Party. I think Libertarians add to the debate in our city and in our country and it's a debate that's worth having. As far as the election itself, um, I for one am very happy the election is done with. There's so much stuff that comes out, so many weird things that happen in an election year that perhaps would not otherwise happen. And uh, I'm really happy to uh, not only have been reelected to another four years in the city council, but going back to City Hall and, and beginning seeing everybody begin to put the politics aside and get back to the business of, of governing and running our great city. Well, now, what do you think we can expect in the next four years? In the years next four the years, we will expect a lot of things. The, the first and foremost task has to be the balancing of a budget that at this point we're expecting a deficit of four billion dollars. That's got to be done this coming spring. It's got to be resolved by June. And it's going to require cuts in expenses and hopefully not, but there's always a possibility of looking for additional revenue sources. Okay, yeah. How about uh, just cutting down the size of the government so that it's not so expensive? Well, that's true. I mean, <clears throat> if, if we could cut out all of our expenses, I guess uh, we would do that. But I think it's easier said than done. We, we have a, a massive budget in the city of New York. $50.2 billion for this current well, I would argue year. that's the whole problem. I think it should be about $50. <laughs> well, I, you know, I th look at mass transit for one. I think mass transit is something where we clearly should have public subsidies for. Why? Because it's good to encourage people to take mass transit. It reduces air pollution. It cuts down on traffic congestion. It promotes and stimulates the economy as a whole, allows our city and our region to grow. So it makes perfect sense for public subsidies to be put and invested into mass transit. Okay. Now that is a point on which you might get, actually get some agreement from some libertarians. Oh, I think most of, us, most of us would like to privatize everything, mm. although there are a few of us, I think, who uh, feel that there is a place for uh, government in things like mass transit. Right. But can we look forward to further crackdowns on private behavior and the use of private property? Such as the uh, the smoking ban that we saw in the uh, in the last term, uh, are we going to see um, <clears throat> further restrictions on uh, on private behavior, supposedly for our own good? Well, I, the the smoking legislation is something that I supported. It, it you promotes would. clean air indoors. It helps all of the people, the majority of people who actually do not benefit and do not enjoy any kind of smoke. And then not why don't, they, why don't they just stay out of those bars if they don't like the not smoke? Not with sand. Well, I think people can go elsewhere. They can stay at home and enjoy their uh, their their polluting habits, polluting not only to themselves. Now, wait a second. If I own a business they, and I want to let people uh, smoke in my establishment, right. what business is it of the government's? You're the, saying that I don't own my, my property, that you own it, and you let me use it on sufferance. I think that in, in a city like New York, it is perfectly reasonable to have regulations, even regulations governing, individual, governing individuals and businesses. There are other, there are other um, rules and regulations that businesses are subject to. For example, the way they dispose of their trash on public sidewalks, the way they, but the way they, pro business. well, the way they process food inside their business. You could argue based on, well using your line of argument, the Department of Health should have absolutely nothing to say with what happens in a business, how, how they handle their food, how they prepare the food, because 
eventually, if customers get sick or they don't enjoy the taste of that food, they won't go. Yeah. Obviously. There you go. But let's do it. Well, <laughs> I, I would never, I would never support something like that. I think city government, municipal government, has every right and responsibility to make sure that people are going to be able to enjoy safe and clean food, and make sure that the process is not going to uh, not only make them sick, but actually possibly spread the disease around beyond the people that actually consume the food there. That reminds me that in some municipalities, there are actually laws saying how, how little or how much a hamburger can be cooked. Are you in favor of that kind of legislation for New York? I'm not a, a culinary expert. I think that there are certain standards that the Department of Health has. Uh, now, we should uphold those standards, and to the extent that the experts, and I'm not a cooking expert, I wish I was, uh, to, the ex to the extent that experts think that the standards should be raised or relaxed, changed in any way, I would defer to those experts. Okay, so basically you're in favor of government by people who know better than the rest of us and who legislate for our own good. Is that basically no, the idea? No, I think government is of the people, by the people, for the people and people collectively decide what government do. See, that's far, the problem. Democracy is just two, two uh, wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for breakfast. Well, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think we're not, telling, we're not saying that people should determine what's best for everyone else, but there are certain things, for example, uh, uh, well, the case that we talked about, food experts, nutrition experts, and experts in terms of what is, how, how cool food should be kept to, to uh, to slow down the growth of bacteria in food. I mean, that's not something that I know of, but I would certainly be very comfortable deferring that judgment to an expert, someone who has a degree and someone who has some kind of experience in that kind of matter. And I don't think it's wrong for government to, ex to uh, insist on those kinds of standards, even in a privately run business. Okay, and are you in favor of taxing certain foods because they are deemed less nutritious or less healthful than others? There, I am not opposed to the concept of excise taxes. Excise taxes where people are taxed for a certain behavior or eating a certain kind of food that may have a, a, a negative side effect and mm -hmm. something that ultimately results in some kind of societal cost. Okay, for example, like smoking. Smoking creates a tremendous societal cost in terms of the cost of our health care, in terms of the cost of uh, caring for people who, be, who, for example, get chronic lung disease. Okay, I would argue that um, for one thing, uh, smoking is quite beneficial because smokers tend to be nicer people than non-smokers, and uh, they tend to... Uh, uh, be happier and calmer in their everyday lives, and uh, who knows? I'd say there are um, drawbacks and benefits to smoking, but we <laughs> well, can argue I'll, that one till kingdom come. My point is, though, that... In uh, the interest of full disclosure, I am not a smoker, and I wouldn't hmm. agree with the statement that smokers are generally nicer than non-smokers. <laughs> uh, well, you wouldn't, but uh, uh, in any event, we were talking about um, excise taxes, and basically that means punishing people for certain lifestyle choices of which you may not approve. No, Doesn't it's not punishing imply... people at all. It is exacting, a, it is placing the cost responsibly where the cost belongs. There are certain behaviors and certain eating certain kinds of foods or inhaling certain kinds of substances that, that are legal but still re create some kind of ramification down the road in terms of societal cost. There is nothing wrong with placing the cost where the cost actually okay, belongs. If, if, um eating certain foods or drinking certain or smoking certain substances, whatever damages my health. Shouldn't that be the uh, province of, say, insurance companies or uh, other private sector entities rather than the government telling me that they are the stewards of my body and that they have a proprietary interest in my body that trumps any decisions that I might make? Well, again, the excise taxes, they are, it's a well-grounded principle. And uh, it's something that I understand libertarians don't don't agree with, but it's certainly something that that I support so long as it, it places the society co societal cost properly on the certain behavior that results in that societal cost. And you know, down the road, it's not if you were going to be permanently barred from say Medicare when you hit age 65, then you would have a stronger argument. But down the road, when you hit 65, you're going to get Medicare. Now, now we're going to open up the big Medicare can of worms, 
and 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 whether we even whether you and I agree that there should be a Medicare system well, to exactly. begin with. That's, that's part of the whole argument. Right. Um, my my position and the basic libertarian position is you're never going to get to heaven if you don't die, and um, every person has the right to get to heaven or to hell in his or her own way. The um, <clears throat> the common people do not have a proprietary interest in well, each the, person. The, the reason why we have Medicare is because there are plenty of people who would like to still stick around and don't necessarily feel that they're ready for heaven, but their health had deteriorated to the point where because they're senior citizens and they're on fixed incomes, they're no longer able to afford their medical care. And that's why the Medicare system was implemented to begin with, to allow those people the, the right kind of choice to go to heaven when they feel they're ready, okay. not the, prematurely. Uh, the libertarian argument would be, though, that if the um, supply of uh, doctors and other healers were not artificially suppressed, then... Um, and were left to the free market, then prices of health care would go way down and there would be no need of Medicare. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there are other people who oppose the Medicare system who would argue that the system actually artificially increases the supply of doctors and health care providers and not depressed. But one way or another, it's uh, controlling that section of the economy. It's not controlling it. Look, the, uh, it, the Medicare system is a necessary system. It takes care of people who are no longer able to take care of themselves. They're on fixed income. And Medicare, by providing the care up front and on a regular basis, as opposed to when things get to the emergency or critical level, ultimately saves us overall societal, societal cost and makes it more efficient okay. and keeps people more healthy. That, that is an argument I've heard several times, but um, I wonder if, um, even if the, granting that that's true, which I don't, but uh, you're basically saying that the end justifies the means, aren't you? And isn't that the uh, uh, idea behind any type of Demoblican or Republicrat ideology? <laughs> there, there are lots of things that we do on a daily basis where the ends justify the means. Uh, you, you, you need to get to work. Uh, there, why would anybody cram themselves on the four train going downtown to Wall Street from Grand Central Station when it is the most disgusting in, in the hot, on a hot summer day? It is absolutely unbearable, and yet thousands of people do it on a daily basis. The means, it stinks. Well, okay. So but why they not still have to get to work. The private sector it still has to get to work. The means, the ends justifies the means. People still have to get to work. As far as pr privatizing what? The subway yeah. system? Yes, why not? Why not try it? The, the, um, there are lots of reasons not to try it. In fact, um, this mayor, as well as many previous mayors, has actually tried to um, I guess publicize is not the right word, but to make public the private companies, private bus companies. It makes sense oh, that makes for sense, a yeah. region, it makes sense for a region such as metropolitan New York to have its transportation services coordinated by one entity. Now, I'm not a great fan of the MTA, but it still makes sense that we have one entity run all of the, run and coordinate all of the mass transit services from commuter rails to subways, to buses, and, and even paratransit services. So it does make sense that, uh, that one entity. Okay. If you, so if, you would say then that uh, it should be um, not legal for somebody to uh, start up his own bus company, or if he could somehow get hold of the land, dig his own tunnels, and um, run his own subway system? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think if people had the wherewithal to start their own mass transit, they should do it. I mean, there are, and, and in fact, in this city, there are there are private bus companies, private charter companies who carry people on a regular to, basis. Uh, to abolish them, correct? We're, we're talking about private franchise companies that have, for decades, had contracts with the city of New York. But in terms of private entrepreneurship, there are, there is room for transit services. I started mentioning there are private bus charter charter companies that carry people on a daily basis on regular routes. There are commuter vans. The taxi and limousine and livery car service industry is still, for the most part, private, privately run, operated through uh, through the market system. And so there is room. But mass transit in terms of subway systems and investing in the infrastructure, that is something that is, would be very, very difficult for private companies to do. Oh, difficult, and I makes, agree, yes. But, and it uh, does make sense for the public it. sector to, uh, to undertake those kinds of investment eff inf efforts in our infrastructure. Okay. 
How about the taxi system, though? Why is that so tightly controlled? Why, why are the number of medallions um, kept artificially low? The, some people would argue that it's not artificially low. The medallion system is something that I actually don't fully agree with. It's been in place for uh, going on 30 years. The, the, the stool system that we currently have, medallions versus the uh, livery car service, for hire car services, uh, is something that, that, is, that makes New York City rather unique and is, has probably outlived its usefulness um, for, for, for some time now. Would you be in favor of deregulating taxi fares and let every cab company set its own prices? No, I think that the, I think that the average New Yorker, when they jump into a, 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 a car service or a cab, a yellow taxi cab, would like to know how much they're going to pay for the, de the destination that they're going to. Okay. Probably would like, but uh, doesn't that uh, put undue burdens on the, um, um, the taxi company who finds its prices there, regulated by the, uh, by the government? There is nothing th in, a, in a municipality like New York City, especially in a congested municipality, uh, we actually, I believe, we have the responsibility to regulate the activity on our streets because it is a scarce resource. It is not an unlimited resource. And by allowing people to use the scarce resources to conduct their business, such as a taxi company, it's perfectly reasonable to ensure that they meet certain kinds of standards. Okay. Um, there would be another um, libertarian if, disagreement. Yes, go ahead. If, if we were in the wild, wild west, where there was lots of room, lots of freedom for any, everybody to do anything and everything they wanted. Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. It's a free country. But in a municipality like New York City, we have certain very scarce resources. And in exchange for using those resources, even if it's a private business or private individual, there's nothing wrong with the city of New York or any other municipality for that that matter, to expect certain kinds of standards to be upheld. Okay. It appears to me that among these resources, so to speak, are the people that populate New York. Uh, it seems that the government is actually treating us not as free citizens, but as a resource whom the government owns lock, stock, and barrel, uh, basically to um, squeeze money and toil out of. The standards that I speak about are standards that are set by government, but the, the standards are also in large part, and in, in for the most part, desired and expected by all the people of the city. It's not that government owns the people. Nobody owns you. Nobody owns me. The standards are standards that most people on the street expect and expect that the government ensure compliance with. Okay. On that point, I would certainly concede. I think the uh, results of the last election proved it. Otherwise, Aud Audrey Silk would be our next mayor. Um, but uh, <clears throat> well, what? Uh, let me ask you, just for my own edification, what what change would Audrey Silk make to the taxi industry, or, or you know what, to 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 the the uh, the food establishment, anything that you like? Okay, I think that uh, the taxi industry probably would be a low priority. I think all um, reasonable libertarians would concede that to install a libertarian system would be the work of decades, perhaps even a century or more. Okay. Um, so the, the highest priority, or one of the, the highest hi priorities. Audrey's highest priority in this, as mayor of this town would have been to um, relax or, non or stop enforcing laws that govern private behavior and private property, such mm -hmm. as the smoking ban. Mm -hmm. It would have been either repealed or uh, she would have stopped enforcing it uh, right. to, to the uh, What about laws that prohibit... Possible. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What about laws that prohibit an establishment from barring entry to someone because of the, their, their race? Would, would, would those laws, should those laws also be repealed? I think it could be argued that those laws should not be repealed because we're talking about initiation of force. If I, if mm -hmm. I am a, a public accommodation and I deny you services mm -hmm. on the basis of your race or your ethnicity or what have you, then I'm initiating force against you. Uh, as opposed to if I allow smoking in my establishment, I'm not forcing you to um, deal with that smoke unless you choose to come in and partake of my services. That, that I think, is the crucial difference. Right, but what about, what about the building code where it says that uh, certain, certain restaurants cannot have more than X number of people? 
I mean, obviously, when people go into a bar or a restaurant and they feel it's too crowded, maybe they should leave. But should someone be looking at that to make sure that that kind of standard is upheld by that establishment? Well, we would argue that maybe having these standards is a fine idea, but uh, it ought not to be controlled by government. It ought to be uh, overseen by a private organization of, um, of so restaurant the owners, for fire example. fire code should be self-regulated? And then how, how would you... Um, how would you dis then ensure it uniformity between restaurants and, say, other establishments like movie theaters? You wouldn't. So there would be no uniformity and therefore no real standard that New Yorkers or, or people of any municipality could expect. That's probably about right, yes. Okay. Uh, we never say that libertarianism would be exactly what everybody wants, but we just think it would be right. closer to uh, perfect and, and perfect society than what and, we've got now. And, and neither is a, is a Democratic or Republican-controlled government. It's not perfect. But I, I'm a Democrat. I'm a lifelong Democrat. And I do believe in many of the Democratic ideals under which we would govern a city like New York. Okay. And on that note, I'm going to just break in here for a couple of minutes and remind our viewers that if you are a little bit less interested in the Democratic or Republican parties and a little more interested in the Libertarian parties, you should visit our website, www.manhattanlp.org. That is the uh, website of the Manhattan chapter of the Libertarian Party. That will give you a lot of information on the libertarianism in general and will provide links to the state and national libertarian websites. Once again, that is www.manhattanlp.org. And once again, I am here with uh, John C. Liu, a member of the New York City Council for um, Flushing and Northeast Queens. Yes. And um, we are um, discussing the um, nefarious behavior of the city government and. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't think it's nefarious. Solutions. No, but that's for me to say. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, another point on which many um, members of city government have been particularly um, inflexible is the issue of gun control. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we see more and more efforts to um, ban or severely restrict private ownership of guns, both in the city and in the state. And I noticed from your voting record that you tend to support them. Now, yes, why is I'm that? A, I, I'm in very, uh, I am in full support of stronger gun control legislation. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I, I, I don't see any reason for people to, uh, to carry guns, especially some of these guns that, are, uh, that serve no purpose except to kill people. And the, the Excuse me, but that is why people should have guns in this town, is to defend themselves. Don't you agree? No, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that that's true at all. I think people do not need to rely on guns to defend themselves. I think we well, have bear in a mind, police though, the, force. The police does not have an affirmative duty to protect you. The police only has an affirmative duty to intervene after the crime has been committed. The police are responsible for protecting the public. And you can argue the legal legalities of affirmative versus whatever. Uh, the police are there no. to protect people and the families. They do not have an affirmative duty to protect, only, only to go after criminals. And are you telling me that I do not have a self-evident right to protect my person, my family, and my property? You do have a right. And, and, when you, and I'm not saying that guns should be banned completely. There's a permitting process that everybody should go through. And so you need so to. So, in go, other words, you're saying that it's a privilege to be able to defend myself not a privilege, and not a right. But it's, there's nothing wrong with, again, the city, a municipality, setting standards for whom should be allowed to carry guns. In this case, a background check to make sure that, that there's no criminality in your history, or not in your history, but in a person who would wish to purchase a gun's history. Uh, that's something that, that's a standard that it's reasonable for the municipality okay, so you're, to you're set. You're saying that um, someone who is uh, not an evident danger to society, that is a law-abiding person or somebody who's been co convicted of a nonviolent crime, he does not mm -hmm. have a self-evident right to defend his home. That, that would only be a privilege granted by the government on sufferance. Is that what you're telling me? Well, I think that uh, you, you can say that the only reason that someone would want to have a gun is to to protect their home or their family. I don't think it's as simple as that. I think, again, it doesn't hurt 
it is actually in the public's interest to make sure that there are standards. We have dr we have licensing for many other for many other daily activities. And Drivers many, of those, many should, of those activities should, should not be licensed. Should well, should people be licensed in order to drive an automobile? We're I mean, not talking don't, about automobiles. We're well, talking we're about we're talking guns. about licensing. We're talking about the the issue of a municipality or government setting certain standards by which people have to comply with before they are before they are allowed to undertake certain activities but, that could pose that, a danger to other people issue such by as issue. driving such as driving a car why is it that we have to license people to drive a car isn't it everybody's it right could be argued, to purchase a, it could be argued that there's a right of the government to uh, license driving on public roads that that is certainly an arguable point but to regulate um, how a person chooses to set up a defense of his own home, I think that's something else again. You're basically saying that the um, citizen does not own that property, that it's only lent to him by the government, and that his means of defending it are also restricted by the government because they apparently have some sort of proprietary interest. No, in gu guns are not the only means of protecting one's home, oh, and no, you guns can do it with are a not limited. Instrument. Guns are not limited to the, to the home. Uh, they can be brought anywhere. Uh, would you? Would would it be perfectly okay for us, for students to bring guns into public schools? I happen to think not. I, I think that's an area. I wouldn't say it's commendable, but, but, but then I don't thing, approve of public schools either. But, <laughs> I well, think they should all be given, private, and if a private school decided to ban... Obviously, a libertarian system, as you said, would take decades to implement if we ever came to that. But given that there are public schools, should students be carrying guns into public schools? Or should we have a way to make sure that those guns are kept outside the school? I would say that in the very narrow question that you've asked, public schools, yeah, I would I say... I think all of the questions that we've been discussing today are relatively narrow in the way that they've been phrased. No, I, I For phrase example, them, I phrase guns them are not only used I phrase them to you tend defend them. your home, and that is not the only way well, to defend your home. Well, people sometimes use alcohol for nefarious purposes either, but it's not outlawed. I'm terribly sorry, this is real interesting, but I've been yes. told to wrap this up. So I'd like to say thank you to John C. Liu, member of the New York City Council, and to you for watching. Tune in next week for another edition of Hardfire.